All right, this discussion is about producing custom maps with the Google Maps API. Um, it's really aimed at um, people who understand JavaScript, uh, server-side functions, and have uh, used the API in the past. Uh, I'm John Coriat. I'm the presenter. Most people have used the markers and polylines on the maps to you know, indicate objects. They're quite useful. You know, you can display a lot of stuff uh, in all sorts of interesting ways. This is a Delaunay triangulation that I, I created. Um, but they suffer from the slow script problems, uh, performance, uh, erratic map movements when you get past a certain number. Obviously, this is an exceeding, exceedingly large number. But uh, generally, it seems to be about somewhere between 50 and 150 objects that uh, cause this, this problem. Once you exceed that problem, you have to have a number of uh, uh, methods of, of solving it, in, you know, like clustering, um, using the marker manager, things like that work to a degree, but th they do suffer from a lot of uh, data intensive transactions uh, between the server and the, the map. They also have some limitations as to what they can do. So in conclusion, mark markers and polylines are, are fun and easy, but they suffer from uh, performance problems and they're not optimum for lots of data. I, I found that the best thing to, to display lots of data with is uh, are image overlays. And there are two types of image overlays. You have whole image overlays and you have tile overlays. Uh, an example of a whole image overlay is a ground overlay, the G ground overlay, which is a standard feature in the Maps API. This takes a flat projected image and stretches it to the map. Uh, flat projected images have an equal number of pixels north and east and west, north, south, east, and west, so that they're essentially, they are unprojected. Does that make sense? Everyone understand that concept of unprojected, flat? Um, projected images look, you know, they look more like the standard map. Unprojected ones are these, that's unprojected, it's kind of squishy. Um, example of uh, unprojected uh, image being projected, you notice how it's stretched out nicely. This is ground overlay doing this work. It's really a phenomenal bunch of JavaScript that, that does this. What it actually does is divide the image into three chunks and stretches each little piece a little bit depending on um, where in latitude and longitude or latitude uh, the image falls. So it looks like a seamless image. It's really amazing how this is done. Uh, it, but it, uh, in the process, like any JavaScript, it's elaborate and it uh, causes erratic movement. All right, I have, um, let me see, make sure I can do this right. Okay. All right, I have a couple of demonstrations here. Let's see if I can get this to work. This is a, a fitter algorithm that, or a page that uh, Pam wrote. I copied it and stripped out some of the stuff, but this is a clone of her page that you can take an image and display it on the map. This is that same unprojected image. And you can stretch out the image to make it fit. And it's really quite clever the way uh, the system works. You know, so you find how the, how the image fits on the map. And you get uh, you know, the latitude and longitude of the corners. And you can move it around. You can stretch it. All kinds of fun stuff with it. And uh, See right there in a couple of steps, I've gotten something fairly close. It's just a matter of playing with it. But once you get once you get something that's fairly close, then you can create a, a set image. Here's an example of a map that's got a ground overlay, and it's it's fairly snappy. But when you start zooming in, you get some slowish behavior out of it. Um, and this one seems to work, be pretty snappy. But you see even, even up here on the lakes here, the, the image fits really well. So this is ground overlay with, a, with a, uh, projected, uh, an unprojected image, a flat image. That works pretty well. Is uh, that snapping when you at the end to the borders? Uh, oh, uh, when we're back here? Yeah, when you did it. Yeah, you, you just pick it up and you, you drag it and you drop it. And it's just a marker. Right, it's you not know? snapping to anything. This oh, is it's just not using like, like manual tweaking. Oh, it's just um, yeah. manual. So oh, okay. ground overlay is just defined by its bounding box. And so what these basically are are just uh, markers that you're dragging around to yeah, define right. the bounding box. So this all this is is one one uh, one image. I'm going to split up a little bit. Right. 
Yeah, so it's, it's very clever and it's, it's really amazing. And, and what's amazing is that this image here fits so well uh, after you stretch it. And when you consider it's only three images, that's, that's really quite phenomenal. And the way that they do it is they, they locate pixel boundaries and stuff so that there's no smudging. It's really amazing. So you might want to zoom in on that just to show what happens when you go in really far. Okay. It does actually lose itself after you go four levels in, I think. And um, it's been said that that's a bug, but I don't think that's a bug as much as it's a capability issue. So, you know, what is it, a bug or a capability? Let's see, that's even, notice also the image, of course, is smeared and it's pixelated because you're stretching <laughs> one image out. So there is limits to what you can do with this. But if you've got some image that you want to put on the map and it's, you know, you're don't, not going to deal with a lot of zoom levels, this is a great way to do it. It's simple, it's clean, and generating a flat image out of a program is fairly easy if you've got the data. Can it be transparent? Unfortunately, you don't have uh, opacity options with ground overlay. Um, that's, that's some of the limitations. But this is essentially a, a simple, easy, whole image overlay. Yes, go ahead. So if you made that really high resolution image, then it would slow down even more all the processing on that? Well, yeah, you'd take that high resolution image and you'd cram it in to yeah. a little piece, you know. So you're still loading the full image. It's not trimming it out. It's just doing what browsers do with big right. images. It would look cleaner and closer in, but it would be it would. slower. And also, you've got to remember that that image then extends out into the memory. So, you know, you're, you're taking a lot of risk by using a big image. But still, even, even zoomed in this fast or this far, this thing works pretty well. It just is ugly, <laughs> you know? It gets all smeary and stuff. So it's not really usable for the users when you start zooming in. But as, as, a, as a way of getting an image on the map, this is really great. And it could be satellite pictures. It could be like aerial photos is a good example. Once you locate them on the map, they, they you know, move around with it. They, they, in, uh, they zoom in, zoom out. So it's really a great way to do it. Okay. Any other question? Yes, sir. If you do your markings on the map, like a line or a, or a fish printer or whatever, when you put the picture on top, does it come through or is it behind the picture? Um, as you can see from this one here, it's on top. So the markers are on top of the, the ground overlay layer. But I mean, if you put uh, something on the map and then put the picture on top, you would lose the markings from the map. Like all the states are gone. Oh yes, right. You have no opacity options with this this thing, and and w because of the way that it works with with Inter Internet Explorer, you have a choice of opacity or transparency. So you could create it with an alpha channel, but it's going to use the uh, alpha loader in IE, and so you don't you can't use them both. You have a choice of opacity or transparency. So if you use alpha channel on this, this would be, you know, whitish covering the ocean and you wouldn't have transparency. So it, it, it's, it's good. It's a good way to do it. It has some limited features, but for quick and dirty, you can't beat it. Anything else? Okay. Let's go back to this. Okay, so that's that. And in conclusion, uh, flat images work well. It's difficult to align, and we have performance issues. But other than that, it's, it's for quick and dirty, fast ways of, of doing it, it. All you need to know are the corners, and you can place an image on the map. Uh, there's a couple of really good examples out there of people did uh, for Area 51 where they superimposed, you know, things on top of airfields, and, and it, that's pretty cool. Uh, what did you have on your one? You had. Um, I had the volcano. Um, volcano, volcano, right. But I've actually done it, um, I did it with an old, we had aerial photos from my house when I was a kid. And uh, I'm kind of mad because right now on Google Maps it shows that somebody has built a house on our land, <laughs> right? So uh, I have, I sent this to my family, it's just a ground overlay that is our old aerial photo overlaid on the map so they can see what it used to be like before right. people intruded. And see, using KML, that's even easier. Right. You know, so you can create that as a KML object and load it through my maps right, even. Right, because ground overlay is actually taken from KML. So you can either do it via the G ground overlay class in the Maps API, or you can find a KML that has the ground overlay defined in it, and it'll work equally the same. The bottom line is it's simple, it's easy to use, and it, it's, it's fun.
All right, the next whole image overlay is, I call it projected overlay, that's a class I wrote in JavaScript. Um, it takes an, a projected image as opposed to an unprojected image and sticks it on the map in a similar way to ground overlay, except for it doesn't do all that extra stretching and, and, and stuff. So it, it ends up actually um, being faster. It, it suffers less from uh, zooming. And there's another really neat effect that you can do is you can uh, have programs generate the data to spit out to the, the map. Uh, as an example, here we have a, a projected overlay, and it slaps onto the map very cleanly. There's no stretching, and you end up with a, a cleaner, easier to see image. The really the only difference between ground overlay and this class that I wrote is I just stripped out a lot of the stuff uh, and added. I don't know if you've used oh, was a T photo. A T photo is the uh, uh, I forget. Is that Mike Williams one of his G geniuses? I, I I believe Mike Williams wrote T photo, but T photo. Uh, was a, a similar type thing, except for that I needed to have a little extra functionality. So I borrowed from T-Photo, I borrowed from Ground Overlay, and I created this one. The, everything, by the way, that you see today is downloadable, all the source code, all the server-side stuff, everything. So you can download the data to create every one of these examples. So um, just keep that in mind. So as a demonstration, I have a couple of examples there. and. Let's see. And there is, there's, you can see it's similar to this one. Oops, let's go back down. Maybe a little bit in. It's similar to looking to this one, but it looks cleaner because there's no stretching. And as you zoom in, of course, it still looks clean. It's, it's really a simple thing. This is actually counties in the United States downloaded from the census and generated out of a program as an image, uh, as a projected image, so using the Mercator projection. Um, I have a, a, a Perl module that's pretty easy to read, can be translated in very easily into any other language, but to calculate all the things that you need to create tiles and um, understand how to, to fit them into, into images that, that appear on Google Maps. It, it, it's written in Perl. I don't know if any of are you are familiar with Perl. Perl is a fairly easy to read language. Uh, if you've done Java or JavaScript or C or um, PHP, it's almost directly translatable. So if you just take this module that I wrote and copy the formulas out of it, which I got out of the API, you know, by picking through the JavaScript, um, you can create your own or use my one. You know, feel free. And here's another example. Oh. That's, uh, let me see, I'm a little, got that in the wrong spot. Here's an example of a, of a projected overlay. This is, these are counties generated directly out of data and displayed on the map. If I move this, this is the same stretcher thing. It uh, goes, it's going down to the, it just generated that image on the fly using Postgres, the database Postgres, doing a bounding box query into the database to pull out counties that fit directly into that bounding box. And here are the counties that fall into that bounding box. This is in this area, obviously. And um, the data, like I say, is available from the census. Oh, one other thing you have is you have opacity options with this. So you can, you know, go, you can make a slider or something fancy out of this, too. I just have, uh, you notice, it's really simple to set opacity. You just dot set, set opacity with a number in it, and that's the percentage. That's 50 and 100%. But as you change this little box, it goes down and does another query and comes up with a different list. And another interesting thing that's going on in this program is that the image being generated by the Perl program, this is Perl using GD, um, what it does inside is it p attaches a cookie to this image. And the cookie is received into the page, and inside that cookie is this metadata for the counties that is contained within the image. So that's kind of a cool thing. And um, so instead of having to have the, uh, the client, the browser, say, OK, you just sent me something, what's in it? And then go down and have the, the uh, server regenerate that data, because it'd have to do another similar bounding box query to say, OK, well, here are the counties that are in that image. What happens inside this image is the image already does the query. So it says, OK, I've got this data. Let me just bound it up as a cookie and send it off to the, the browser. And then the browser harvests the cookie and erases it. 
So it, are they stored in a database as a series of points? Yeah. You're using Postgres GIS? No, Postgres SQL straight. Oh, not GIS. I use PostGIS, yes. I use that to, to handle shapefiles and do a lot of cool things. But when it comes to server performance, PostGIS is a lot slower than PostSQL, a Postgres uh, standard spatial functions. But we're talking orders of magnitude here because the PostGIS library is external. So every time you execute a PostGIS function, it has to load it from the external world and then operate on the data one at a time. Now, with Postgres, uh, Postgres SQL itself, the standard spatial functions like at and you know the distance functions and various things, they are executed as native functions. You will see at least 10 to 100 times faster using Postgres as opposed to PostGIS. Now, on the other side, PostGIS does a lot more. You can do union sets of polygons. You can do uh, you know intersection points. You can do all kinds of, you can do actual distance calculations using miles and such, you know, or kilometers. You can do that using PostGIS and a million other things. But it is slower. It's slow as the Dickens. And uh, I did one little test a couple months ago where I was looking for, um, I forget what it was, it was uh, bounding, or uh, things that intersected with each other. And I wrote it in PostGIS and it started executing and I had 60 million things I had to go through. I estimated it would take 600 days to run. <laughs> and I turned around and I rewrote it with the native SQL, post SQL functions and it was done in 20 minutes. So, you know, I, it was like phenomenally faster. And I, I think you will see, if you're doing simple things, if you're looking for bounding boxes, if you're looking for point and polygon, if you're looking for distance, closest point to A, you know, those calculations, they're native functions in Postgres. You have to load the polygons as a different kind of data. They are polygon data types in Postgres as opposed to um, uh, spatial objects in PostGIS. The data format is slightly different, but they are much faster to execute. It's easier to work with. I find PostGIS a little bit cumbersome to work with in programs. Uh, the data is, is not as easy to, to play with. Yes, go ahead. Do, do other databases do those things? Like, could you do that in MySQL or SQL Server? Or? Uh, I mean, because post, the Postgres you're talking about is just, it's just like a standard, you know, it's the one that, you know, Sun didn't buy, right? I mean, <laughs> it's the other really big, you know, database that people use source. for, right? The, the, yeah, the question is, I have to repeat the question. Um, <laughs> the question is, can other databases besides Postgres do this? The answer is yes and no. MySQL will do a lot of things, um, but they don't, they really haven't really implement, implemented the spatial functions fully yet. You can do bounding box calculations, but you can't do point and polygon. You can do distance calculations, but you can't really do them right. Um, I think probably, you know, now that they've been purchased by a big guy, maybe they'll advance it, maybe they'll abandon it. Who knows? But uh, there are some things that'll do. Another thing that I find that MySQL is a little bit more cumbersome with is that it stores the data in the WKB format, the well-known binary, as opposed to WKT, well-known text. Postgres in the polygon format is, is a, a human-readable format. GIS, it's that WKB format. It's pretty annoying. You do a data dump, you got garbage, you can't read it. You know, um, you have to use a function to get the data out in a readable format and it's a little less friendly, I find. But Postgres, um, I'm just a Postgres fan, I guess. As far as um, uh, SQL Server, Microsoft, I'm sure, sells a, a wonderful addition. <laughs> it's, it's extra. Same with Oracle. Oracle yeah, has a Oracle spatial. Uh, from what I understand, I haven't worked with it myself. It's, it's top notch. Uh, but you know, I mean, you just whip out the checkbook and start writing checks, and don't right. stop. And every year, you're gonna have to write another one. Yeah, but with SQL Server, you go from you know the the workstation to standard to you know enterprise, and you move up. And it seems like the only difference between them is you can run it with a gajillion processors. You know, like workstations one processor, standards two processors. Like they don't don't say anything about GIS stuff when you move to the next version. Um, I, I'm not really sure how. Um, Microsoft wants to work things, but the bottom line is with Microsoft is you got to pay for it. Mm -hmm. You know the great thing about MySQL, Postgres, PostGIS; these are all free. 
you know, or open source products. So, you know, it doesn't matter how big your company or how small your company is. Like for, for instance, my company, US Naviguide, we're only, you know, one, two, and three people depending on the workload. And uh, if I had to pay $7,000 for a license to SQL Server and then another four or 5000 for the spatial functions, I, I, you know, I wouldn't do it. Couldn't do it. I'd have to find something else. You'd have to fire someone. <laughs> or or I, I'd have to, to charge more. I couldn't give free things away. Like, like for instance, uh, you know, the zip code maps are all free. You know, if they run under the free API using, you know, free Linux-based servers, uh, not free, open source Linux-based servers, uh, open source-based languages like Postgres or, or uh, like Perl, open source extensions for Perl like GD. GD is wonderful. I don't know if any of you have used GD. G is, GD is extremely powerful for image manipulation. All this is done with GD and Perl. GD also works with C and also uh, PHP. There's Image Magic is another one. Wait, what part of this is done with GD? Inside, wh what part of this is done with GD is inside of the server. What I'm doing here on this page is I'm sending the coordinates of this bounding box to the server, which happens to be this laptop, and I'm taking a, a Perl program, a Perl script, and I'm saying, give me all the, the counties inside of this bounding box. Like you, that's a SQL statement to right. Okay. That that contain that, that fully contain these counties. And then I get back the data in the form of human readable polygon data. I parse it with Perl, and then I take it and I create filled polygons in with GD. GD is the image manipulation program, and create PNG images directly out of GD and transmit them back to the server as a fully formed image. So that's what's going on here. When that's I'm, magic, man. Yeah, see. That's awesome. <laughs> now, Eric just did it again. You see how fast that is? I mean, that's incredibly fast. And there's 3,500 polygons in the in this country that make up uh, the various <laughs> counties. So you know, I mean, just that fast. And you know, when you zoom in, as you zoom in, you know, it does it again. And now I put labels on them. Oh, when it gets big enough. Yeah, as soon as it gets big enough to hold a label, I put a label on, and, and that's done. Trans I don't know how to say that. Opacity. So it, it, you can add opacity and trans... Like, it, easily, it, it also has transparency, too. Be, or, um, there's a trick here. There's an alpha channel, I mean, you know. There's right? a little trick here that, um, that, that seems kind of odd. With Internet Explorer, this works just as well. And, and what's funny is that because this is a .pl image, it's not a .png image, alpha channel or transparency and opacity work. Don't ask me why. <laughs> you know, it, it's like Microsoft decided that they were going to treat PNGs as a, as a, you know, uh, a secondary data type or image type, and and created this limitation on them with the alpha, um, or the uh, what's it called the alpha loader. Alpha, alpha loader, and for some reason uh, it works with Perl. You know, with Perl generated images. Did so, you write all that stuff down somewhere? I mean, like, how would we remember that? I mean, that's you can download. Uh, like I say, you. All of the code in all of these examples is downloadable. So you can download this program that generates this code. You can download the data that produced this. You can put them on your own Linux server or Mac server or whatever you want or put them in. You can also do uh, all this works under Windows. Uh, Active Perl is a program available for, for Windows. Uh, Postgres with PostGIS is available for Windows. Um, obviously, you know. Uh, uh, Apache and all those other things are available. So these can be all done under any operating system. You might have to tweak the, the various you know file names and such to work under Windows, but it should work under any Linux server. And all those are free modules or open source modules from uh, available as RPMs or you know um, directly from the the creators. I, I prefer to actually compile everything from source rather than download them as RPMs and get better versions. Well, plus you have a better understanding of what's going on, right? At this point, I think I probably have a fairly good understanding, <laughs> but it's really not that difficult. Once you see the code, the mystery is the fact that you can do it. You know, that's what I think is the big stumbling block, is that people don't realize that you can do this with easy-to-use tools and fast. But the mystery is just how, not, not, or the fact that you can, not the how. The how is actually very easy. The code to do this is incredibly simple. It's almost like using the API. You just initialize a new object, and you say this is a new image object, and 
I'm creating a polygon and here are the points and color it this and you know make the image this size and shoot it out to standard out you know it's there's no no real big deal here you know it's really quite simple it seems like a big deal but <laughs> I mean that looks cool I, I just can't believe that all of what's all of what it's doing well once you you see the actual code and it's the download uh, site is on the last page here but the, the, the all the stuff is available for download and uh, you can create your own tiles. I have a tile cutter. I have uh, um, all kinds of other things that I'll get to here in a minute. Yeah, we should do that. Yeah, okay. Okay, does that print out when you print it? It would, yeah, because that's an image. It's not, it's not an overlay. So, yes, it would print out, or it should. It never really tried. I, I don't do much printing. I'm not a, a tree cutter. So, but I believe that in since... In real estate, they like to cut the trees. I, I believe, as far as printing goes, that image overlays work because they are not objects. They're not uh, marker type objects. Um, they're just images. So they work just like if you can print a map, you can print these. I'm not sure how the opacity and all that works with printing. Um, that's not something I'm too familiar with. All right, so in conclusion, uh, projected overlays work good for a single viewport type image. That's one of the limitations of this type of whole image overlay, is that you have to stick to one viewport. So you can't have a, an image overlay that's, that would take up 10 viewports, because if you were looking at a 1024 by 768 viewport, and you multiply that by 10, you're looking at a 10,000 pixel image, which obviously is not going to work. You know, it, it may load for some people, but it's going to be sluggish. It's going to be difficult to deal with. So you should keep whole image overlays to a single viewport. Or like in the case of this one here, what you could do is you could monitor the zooming and when, uh, on zoom end, refresh, re-change re the, the bounds of the map or of the, the image overlay to the map viewport and refetch a new image. So you could do it that way. But, and as you pan on drag end, you know, fetch a new image to replace the existing one. But that's sort of a, a poor man's tiling routine, I, I suppose you could say. Um, but I would say that for, for these whole image overlays, you keep it to a single viewport, not more than a couple of zoom levels, and um, it works well for project or program generated images like this one with the counties. And uh, if you need more uh, than that, the best thing to do is go to a, a tile system. Okay. All right. Now for tile overlays, any more questions on that? Okay. Tile overlays are uh, uh, another type of, of image overlay. They're ex incredibly efficient, as you've seen with the Google Maps. Uh, I mean, the, the way the system works is incredibly efficient. It runs easily on, on uh, um, all the browsers. They're very robust. They take up very little memory in terms of the JavaScript that's taken to, to make these things work. It's, it's virtually free to use image overlays. Um, they're flexible. The, the downside is that they're complex to create and understand how they work. Um, now, the first thing you have to understand is, is how the tile system works. Uh, the images are all 256 by 256 pixels. You can use other size images. I, I've seen a couple of examples where somebody tried to use 150 by 150 and they ran into all kinds of problems. I would say don't mess with the, the overlay size. Leave it at 256. As soon as you go outside of that, you start running into little issues of the API not being able to handle what it should be able to handle. According to the API documentation, you should be able to supply it with any size image. But in reality, stick to the standard. That's definitely a warning. Um, don't go outside of that. If you do, you're, you're basically running a risk of, of a malfunctioning map. Um, the, the image, uh, the tile names are, are based on an X and a Y number. And it's extremely simple how it works, yet it's very powerful. And uh, every time you zoom in, what happens is you start with the whole Earth is, uh, let me go down, get ahead of myself. You have the zoom system, the numbering scheme, and uh, the, the way the pixels work. Here's, here's a zoom level zero. It's the whole Earth in 256 by 256 pixels. The upper left corner is zero, zero. In the lower right corner is 255 by 255. That's the pixel numbers. In order to build your own tiles, you have to understand pixels. So at zoom level zero is one tile, which is 
4 to the 0 power, okay, or 1. The number of tiles that, it, uh, that are contained, um, or the number of tiles across and down, are actually uh, 2 to the zoom power. So here we are, zoom level 1. We take that one tile and we cut it into four pieces. So here, zoom level un 1, we now have four pieces. And this is the whole, this is the entire system is based on this chopping it in half. It's brilliant. It really is brilliant. Every time, every time I go to play with this, I just marvel at the simplicity and the brilliance of this system. And using 256, the magic number, as, as the number of pixels really is great, too. So you see, again, the upper left tile is 0, 0. Lower left, 1, 1. And 1, 0, 1, 1. That's the, the, the tile numbering scheme. Pixels is the same. Up in the upper left-hand corner, 0, 0. Lower right hand now is 511, 511 because it's 256, 256, starting with a zero-based system. So that's the world as four tiles. Let me go up again, zoom level two. Now we have 16 <coughs> tiles. It's four across, same system. Only 1023 in the corner, zero up in the top. And now we're three zero and zero three and three three. It's, you know, zero-based numbering for the, the, the pixel system. So this is really, once you start understanding how this, is work, how this works, you can, can really leverage this to your own use. Now, of course, you can use this for anything. It doesn't have to be maps. And here it is as, as a, a, a table. And you can see, once you start building up in zoom levels, like you look down at zoom level 17, there are an awful lot of tiles involved. And there are just a tremendous amount of pixels. 17 million tiles at zoom level 17. 17 million plus, 17.3 million or something like that. That's a lot of tiles. That's why it's very difficult to, to deal this data out on a world basis and why you need somebody like Google to do it. And in terms of pixels, 3.3 million pixels makes up the world. And at, at that, you can show you know, individual buildings. And now we have 18 and 19 we're using now, too, so that even goes beyond that. And uh, I have a little demonstration that shows how that works. Let me see. I put it in the wrong place, but I think it's here. Okay, here we are at zoom level zero. Z zero, one, one pixel. You notice how it tiles across. This is all zoom, no, one tile, right? Yeah, it's wrapping, the wrapping world. Not hip hop, but the <laughs> rapping world. Okay, then we go up one level, and here we have pix zoom one, and now we're one one, or here we are. Well, let's go back over here. Oops, I zoomed in by accident here because I double clicked on it. Um, here we have zero zero again, and one one. So this is the world is four. <laughs> And all these calculations are done with this Perl module. Um, uh, it's a, a tile module that I created, US Navi Guide underscore Google underscore tiles dot PM, that you can take and copy and translate into any language that you want. But all these calculations are critical. If you want to be able to create your own tiles, you have to use these calculations to do it. Um, they're really not complicated. And if you create some sort of class or something that creates these, these numbers for you, you can um, leverage them fairly easily. And uh, so then we go down another. This is kind of, I mean, this is kind of pathetically boring, but you can see, <laughs> see the idea here, you know. And as you go down, so if we go down to really far here, you know, here's zoom level 10. And that's tile 420 by 440, and this is the lat latitude and longitude on the northwest corner and the southeast corner and the different pixels. So, any, anyone have a question on this? It's kind of just a a boring depiction of, of what's actually going on. But this is important information. Yes? Could you go back to the slide with all the numbers um, where you had 17 million tiles but only 3.3 million pixels? Oh, that's yeah. probably right, not right. You know, I, I had yeah, three I people review this, point. and nobody caught that. But I think you are absolutely right. Yeah, I've seen it much bigger for the total number of and pixels. Your, your <laughs> pixel numbers don't quite grow in, a, right. in the pattern they should. Yes, exactly. I've got it. I, I have a problem there. You're right. Somebody do the math. Yep. So, good catch. Idea. Yeah. It's okay, so you caught me on a. You know, I, I had this peer reviewed by, by three different people, and, all, and nobody caught it. So, all three should have been able to, but I guess they just were so dazzled by my wonderful presentation that they didn't bother to <laughs> check the technical details. 
But, you know, it's bound to be, there's bound to be an error, and I was looking for the flaw in the Indian rug. And there it is. Hopefully that's the only one. Okay, um, let's, let's see. Uh, we're here. Okay, here we go. All right, so with tile overlays, um, you have three types of tile overlays. You have ones that are cut from images, so you have an existing image. You have those that are static from data. In other words, that they're created once or they're created on a schedule. And then you have ones that are created on the fly or dynamically. Uh, tiles cut from images are probably the most common type. Uh, that's like, for instance, uh, maps, panor or obsolete paper maps that people have scanned in. Um, panoramic uh, pictures are a really good example. Aerial photos, such things like that. Um, circuit boards even, circuit boards and other kinds of strange things. I've seen documents and books that people have put into, into uh, data, or into tiles and, and created maps out of them. So, you know, you've got to think, what can you use this, this, this user interface for? And essentially what you can use it for is whatever you can think you can use it for. It's amazing the, the very things that you can do with this. And it's not just for maps. You know, any kind of depiction of a three-dimensional thing or, two, or two-dimensional surface can be done with, with uh, this API using tiles. And it, it's, it's fairly easy to do so. There's um, a lot of different resources out there to create these uh, tiles from images. Uh, you have uh, the Map Cruncher from Microsoft. It has some limitations, but it's really very cool. It has an interface that you can you, you indicate points of interest common with the map. And it figures out your map from your 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 page from there your your image. It overlays it in the right spot. You say I think it's three or four points. You target on the map like it could be a, a city or a mountain peak or something like that. And then it automatically stretches the map to the or the, the image to the right shape and cuts it into tiles. There are some limitations on that. It can't be used for commercial purposes. I believe there's a way. There must be. It's Microsoft to pay for this, license it for commercial purposes. But the beta that they have uh, on their website, on the uh, um, what is that, the Virtual Earth website, is um, is for non-commercial use. But it's very cool. Only runs under Windows, so that's kind of a drag. But other than that, it's very cool, very usable. There's the automatic tile cutter script from Photoshop. Um, that's in the map key. I've looked at it. I was going to demonstrate it here on today, but um, I just got CS3. I upgraded to, to 10.5 and, and my old Photoshop didn't work. So I had to upgrade to CS3 and I didn't get that till Thursday. So I, I don't have a demonstration of that. But it does work. The problem that, that the automatic tile cutter, the way it's written right now is, is that it uses the old uh, numbering system of zooms where 17 is the high, you know, is the one earth and zero is the zoom 17 now. Uh, I'm sure just with a couple of quick changes in that, it'll be up to snuff. But that's a, a, an easy way to take an image and cut it up into tiles. There's one that you can download from uh, crazedmonkey.com, which is a, a Unix command line using uh, Image Magic. Um, that's a pretty cool one too, but it has no alignment tool. You have to know where your images lie. But if you know where your images lie, this, this resource is really good because it chops them up really quick and easy, and it, it, it works well. I actually tried it, and it, I was impressed with it. And then there's another option, which is the Perl one that I include with this demonstration which uh, uh, you also have to know the bounds of, but it's, it's based on Perl and GD, takes an image and chops it up into little chunks. It works really well. At least I think it works well. What do you need to know if you have an image, uh, if the image is already like a geotip? Do you have to tell it more, or is there enough in a geotip file? Well, the, that easy. metadata is in the image, but I don't know uh, in, in the case of either the Unix tool or the Photoshop tool, I don't believe it can read that uh, that metadata. You'd have to pull it out and say. You have to tell it what. It's right, but however, using the, like for instance this Perl tile cutter that I wrote, if you could bring it in with a, a you know, with a TIFF reader, you know, module and pull the metadata out, you would you wouldn't need to tell it anything. You could do it all programmatically, and that would be the ideal. You wouldn't want to have to to do anything manual because you're going to make a mistake and it's going to get screwed up. You know, that's just human nature. If you can do it automatic, that's the way to do it. But definitely, if you've got a georeference TIFF image um, and you have a TIFF reader, which I'm sure there's a module out there in Perl that does that, uh, you could do that automatic. But you need to know the corners um, in, a, in a projected or unprojected image. You need to know the corners where it's going to sit on the map. 
in order to successfully chop it up. But if you know that, that's, you, know, you need to know two thing, three things. You need to know the corners, upper left, lower right, essentially, well, which is all the corners. You need to know the zoom level you want to do it with. But, uh, oh, it won't, it's, so it won't do all the zoom level, you just tell it. Well, you have, you have some issues. Uh, as far as zoom levels, you have some issues with images and multiple zoom levels that are the same thing with, as with ground projected image. Here's an example of an image. This is a source image that's an, a natural at zoom 7, which for the United States is about 5,000 by 3,000 pixels. And um, when you cut it up into tiles, you'll see the, the, the effect. You start on the far left at zoom 5, the borders get, you know, pixelated and they kind of disappear. At zoom level 7, it looks right, but then at zoom level 9, it's you know, kind of distorted and pixelated because you're taking one single image and you're stretching it. You know, you can't create data out of nothing, so unless it's a, a vector graphic, you know, you have no way of, of stretching it. So that's the limitation of tiles cut from images. You really can't exceed a certain number of zoom levels on either side. It's generally two. As you can see, if you go down one level and up one level, and then you have the, the one that it's natural at, you, you have a pretty good depiction. But uh, any more than that, and you start lousing it up, you know, it starts to look crappy. And, you know, uh, what you generally do if you're going to do that is you just would use another image. After you go down one zoom level, you would have another image that's less detail or more oh, detail okay. and cut that one. So um, here's a demonstration of... Any other questions before I go to this? Here's a demonstration of a. Oh, that's to the next one. This is a tile level, tile, tile layer cut from an image. And this is zoom level seven. Can we have the opacity options? Um, it works a little different with, with tile layers than it does with a whole image overlay. With a tile uh, image, with a tile layer, if you change the opacity, you have to delete the old layer and add a fresh one in which is a little bit more cumbersome, but it actually works pretty well. Um, Marcelo Montagna wrote a, a cool slider one for his county overlay. I don't know if anyone has seen that. He, he wrote a really nice county-based tile overlay that has a slider opacity system. It's a, a little complicated uh, for a demonstration like this, but what you can do with it is virtually unlimited. Uh, again, it's left to the imagination, but here's that at zoom level. This is overlaid with the standard hybrid level layer uh, that, that's used on the satellite um, maps. So as you zoom in a little further, you notice the lines get kind of jaggedy, and, but you still have, you have great map movement. That's one thing that's, that's wonderful about these tile systems. And, and this is all being done on this little laptop here. These tiles were generated and are being served right here locally as local host. Notice it's a local host uh, job. So this is all being done with this little teeny laptop. And, uh, but it's very snappy. It's ex extremely efficient. And I, I created, oh, there's, there's level 9. This is zoom 9, and you notice now where the boundaries are all real thick. And if we go back down to whole country view, there we go. Now we lose our boundaries. You know, they're no longer black. So you suffer from the problem of, of pixelation, just like you would on an, a whole image overlay. When you, when you take an existing image and cut it up into tiles. But it, it, it's the next level. If you've got a whole lot, go ahead. So to make it nice, you just basically have to have an image for every single zoom level and cut it up. Yes, to make it nice, you really should have, at a minimum, one image per every three zoom levels. That pretty much is, is one for every other works even better. But if you've got one level, one image for every level, that's perfection. You know, you can do that's a really good Google job. Does. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's what Google does. Now, I, actually, I have a demonstration of, of that as well. Um, these, are, these are all tiles cut from static images. So you have an image, done change, cut it up into chunks, divide those chunks into more chunks, and you end up with tile layers that go, in, in this case, five la levels of zoom for one image. Okay, and uh, that's, that's it for that one. Any questions on that? Um, I have a question. Yes. So I understand that the uh, overlay is generated like with your third screen. So the map 
that if you're matching that app with a map from Google with a Google API? Correct. Okay. Yes, what the map is showing is it's showing a, a, a overlay, uh, actually an underlay of a, a county tile layer with overlaid on top of that is the hybrid level, level, hybrid layer, I guess they call it, from the satellite maps. If you've noticed on the satellite maps, they always showed the roads and major roads in the cities. That's a transparent layer with yellow written on top. You just overlay, you can overlay that on top of anything. It's, it's great data because it gives you the, the basics to, to geographically, yeah. And you can see major roads, you can see cities, things like that. It doesn't give you the road detail that, that the, uh, uh, the maps do, and it's not as pretty. But if you're trying to depict something like, for instance, uh, um, Huffington Post had a great map for donors uh, that showed um, splotches of red and blue for, and, and some other colors, depending on you know red for Republican, obviously, and blue for de uh, Democrat, uh, donations from various places. And it was, it was a nice depiction. It was a little messy. But it was a nice depiction of, of uh, using a custom tile layer with an overlay of, of the uh, hybrid level so that you can hybrid layer so that you could see geographically, okay, well, this is New York, and then you could zoom in and say, okay, well, this is you know, this is uh, you know, where I live, and this is Chelsea or whatever, and you know, Manhattan in general, and out, you know, this is a general area, and you keep zooming out, it would show a better, a broader and broader area. Plus they had some other interesting things with the way they handled the data. But that was a really good example of a data layer created, actually that was a data uh, uh, image layer created from data with an overlay of uh, hybrid. So that wasn't done from an image map, the, the, uh, the one at Huffington Post, but it, it was a, a, a nice depiction. Any other questions? Okay. All right, uh, so in, in conclusion, uh, Image overlays or tiles cut from an image have have suffered from some limitations of pixelation, much like whole image overlays. But they're really great for large areas. Um, they can be used for many different purposes, from anything from aerial photos and panoramic maps to circuit boards and uh, um, house plans, for instance, is a, is a, another fun one. I, I remember seeing one where somebody did a, a university, and they had individual where you could zoom into the the buildings and see the layouts of the buildings and the classrooms and they wanted to I remember the post was they wanted to track people inside of the buildings and I, I thought that was an interesting idea but it, it seemed a little bit Orwellian perhaps <laughs> um, okay the next thing is static data tiles now what a static data tile is it's a, it's a tile layer created not from an image but from data much like the, the projected overlay example where I showed the, the, uh, you know, the, the counties that were created inside of a bounding box, you can actually create entire tile overlays directly from the data, skipping the image step. So if you skip the image step, the, the advantages really are huge because you can put more or less on the map depending on the zoom level, much like what Google does with the maps. You can, on a high zoom level, you show you know, just the population areas over a million and when you start zooming in you can say okay now I'm gonna put labels on the map at this zoom the next zoom level I'm gonna show minor cities the next zoom level in I'm gonna show you know a, a census blocks or tracks so you have you have a choice you can make inside the program as to what you display and that gives you a huge amount of power plus the real advantage is you can create perfect tiles because you're creating them for the zoom at that you know at the, cre at the time of creation, you're deciding what's being put on there. You're deciding I want a one pixel or a two pixel boundary. I'm deciding that, you know, I'm going to uh, put a label where I can fit it, et cetera, things like that. Here's an example of tiles of the same t county system, and you notice how much prettier they are. I put the tile numbers up in the corner just for reference. Uh, they don't, obviously don't have to be there. But, you know, as you zoom in, you know, Marin County looks a lot better when it actually traces out the bay. And when you can put the name of the county in there, you know, and that's depending on the zoom level. At zoom level seven, Marin County is too small. If you were to put a, t a, 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 a title in there, it would look all mushy. You know, it couldn't be readable. So rather than put a, 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 an unreadable title, you just leave it off. But you can decide these things at the moment that you're producing the tile. And uh, again, all these, the, the programs that generate these tiles are, are in the download. So, you know, from this example, you should be able to create your own 
tile layer of counties doing this exact same thing. Um, any questions on that? Okay. So here's a demonstration of, now we go to the same type of map, and here we have the same area. These are now, it looks pretty much the same as this, the image generated system, but um, this is zoom level seven, the natural zoom for that other one. But as soon as we start zooming in, you see now I can put labels on the map and it still looks nice and clean. And you zoom in even further and uh, you know everything looks nice and pretty. And what's really cool about this is, is the area that you can cover. I have, uh, in this example, in this demonstration, I have every tile needed to cover the United States from zoom level uh, five to nine. That's, you know, thousands of tiles. And they were fairly easy to generate using the, the census data. Um, but when they're served up, you only serve up the ones that you need. So like as I'm panning across the United States, here or across the Bay Area actually, I'm pulling in more tiles from this side and scrolling them off the other. So, you know, this wonderful tiling system I'm sure everybody's familiar with, but I, I just can't get over it. I, I just love this, the way you can move this thing around. The first time I saw a Google map, I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> and I said, man, that's for me. I want to deal with that. And that's then, everybody's experience. Right. And then we, what was it, Housing Maps? Yeah. Housing Maps was the one who, who, who did the first hack. And I looked at his code and I thought, oh, this is so ugly. I can't do that. I don't want to get into this. And so I just bided my time. And then the API came out in, in June, the end of June of 2005. And I, I was right on it. So I, I thought this is the way to go, and I actually created a business around this. I started this out as a hobby, and now this is all I do full-time is, is uh, creating, you know, custom maps and polygons for customers, and, you know, I, I don't really have a job, you know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't actually go to work. So it's, it's really great. It's a great system. But anyway, you can see how this, this works when, as you zoom it in and zoom it out. Um, that's the real, the real advantage of creating these things out of data directly. And I'll go all the way out to the United States. And you can see at zoom level five, it's, it's a lot prettier. Let me pan across, you know, a lot of counties in the world, or in the United States, rather, world. We think of the United States as the world sometimes, I guess. <laughs> and of course, you have opacity with this as well. Pretty much the same thing, so that's pretty cool. Any questions on that? And again, this code is downloadable, so if you want to create your own. What, what I recommend doing is that you download this code, you, you, you load it on a Linux server and run it exactly as it is. You know, configure everything the way, configure it the way I have it and play with it. Then add options to it. Make changes to it. You may have to play with Perl and even if you're not familiar with Perl, it shouldn't be that much of a stretch to make changes to these programs because the programs are really quite simple. It's just parsing text you know, creating uh, polygons uh, or creating a, uh, an object and adding points to it. It's, it's no different than working with the API. It really isn't. And since the, the way that, that GD works is so simple, I think that you'll probably say, my gosh, I can create X out of this. You know, my company needs a, a Y. I can do this. And, and you can actually then take, take what I've done and translate it into your favorite language. And uh, I don't know if .NET has image... Um, manipulating abilities. It does. Uh, well, you could probably take and translate what I do with GD into the .NET object very easily mm -hmm. because it's, it's all pretty standard stuff. The important thing is that you understand how to reference the latitude and longitude to a pixel location and a zoom. And that is just, it's a simple calculation, but if you, if you, if you start from point and try to create a tile directly, you're going to say this is too hard. So you go through what I've done already, decipher the, the code that I have down on these examples, and I think you'll find that it's really a lot simpler than you than you thought. Okay. So with that static data tiles, the the biggest like basically you just pre-calculated a whole mess of images. Yes, they're all pre-calculated in advance. That's one of the limitations of static data tiles is that let's say for instance it's counties of the United States. Well, they don't change, but once every five or six years, there's a minor change. If it's, if it's something like sales data 
or sales territories, this is a big one, is sales territories. If it's sales territories for my company, and the, I have 150 or 250 salesmen spread out in the United States, and they're constantly jockeying territories. Uh, they've added, like, for instance, I do a lot of territory-based systems that are using zip code as their base unit for territory. You know, some salesman A has this list of zip codes. Salesman B has another list. They want to see them depicted on the map as a big red area and a big blue area and a big green area for the different salesmen. Um, what you need to do with a static data tile system is you need to say, okay, how often do you want an update? And to generate a complete set of tiles for Zoom levels 5 to 17, for instance, can take a lot of time. Um, it's pretty uh, processor intensive. I have uh, customers that run it on um, some of these Dell you know, eight processor systems. They can do it in four to six hours. If you've got uh, a standard quad Mac or something like that, I have a quad Mac 3.0, I run it on, it takes about six. Dual processor systems, 12 to 18. If you want to run it on a Celeron, come back next week. You know, it's just not gonna, not gonna be produced fast. But if you have a reasonable schedule, once a month, I'm gonna regenerate the tiles to show sales areas. Works great, it really does. If, if you can get it to get people to agree. Now, if it's weather or if it's something of that nature that changes moment to moment, it's not going to work. Now, what, what do you use? Like, I mean, you're generating these images, but before you generate the images, the, the polygons, you know, the polygons that are basically a bunch of just X, Y coordinates are somewhere. Where are they at? Like, where do they exist? If someone wants to, okay, you have California and Arizona as your sales area whatever reason and then okay now you got Colorado so now we're going to include Colorado in there like what software do they use to you know include Colorado now okay the question is about source of the data well the source of the data is really wonderful the United States government this is the United States only the United States government passed a rule sometime back that all of their data is not copyrightable so anything that the government produces is free to use in any way we want we can do anything we want with it the Census Bureau produces just absolutely gobs of this data. They have a cartography uh, bound, boundary website. I, I don't have the URL, the URL off the top of my head, but if you put in cartographic boundary census into Google, you'll get right to it. They have st states. They have um, counties. They have the thing called the ZCTA, which is a, a, a sort of a zip code. It's not really very up to date. They have uh, census blocks and... Tra uh, I think they only have blocks. I don't know if they have tracks. They may have tracks, but not blocks. I don't know if sure if they have blocks. They have school districts. They have a lot of data. A lot of it is uh, as of uh, the 2000 census, so it's not that useful. But as far as this demonstration and, and uh, a lot of other uses, if you want states and counties, great source of data. Then there's the Tiger Line database. Tiger is a, a, a database that covers the entire United States down to the street level geocoded. It's an amazing resource. Um, before the current version, which is called uh, 2006 SE, is a, a, a bizarre database, 17 different record types. I mean, it's like, if, you, if any of you who are legacy programmers, you remember what a record type is. A flat file with a header that has a character in it that means that I am an X record. You know, and it's, it's cumbersome, difficult to use. It's the most difficult to use system I've ever come up with. Reading their manual, just like reading an IRS manual. If, if you like doing your taxes, you'll love Tiger. <laughs> However, starting in March of this year, I think sometime in mid-March they're gonna release it. They're gonna start releasing these, uh, um, this data as shape files directly. Oh, really? They're calling it as shape Yes, it's gonna all be shape files. So instead of having to take this data, like what I've done is I take the Tiger data and I, with programs, I create shape files. And it's very complicated and very difficult. I have, when it, back when they would put out a release, it would take me over a month of, uh, of processing time to create a complete shape file file a shape file of the entire United States down to the uh, sub polygon level the, the, called the the A record level, and uh, which is 16 million polygons that define the United States. Now they're going to release that as shape files. Now they're not they're not going to release from what I understand the A file, they're they're going to uh, which is the 16 million polygons, but they're going to release all the others, blocks, tracks, counties, 
states. They, they skip ZCTAs for some reason, which actually I'm glad of because I sell zip code polygons, so if they had published them, I would lose a, a product. But uh, they're, uh, they're not doing zip codes, uh, but they have a lot of other great things. They have school districts and all the, the congressional districts, you know, as they're currently mapped. So this is up to date. Con congressional district, one t or congressional, uh, what's it, the 110th Congress? All the districts are mapped out as polygons that you can download right now um, in the form of shape files from, from that website. So that's an incredible resource. Uh, you can do so much with it, you know, and, and it's c completely copyright free. Anything you create of it, you can resell it. And I do. I create all kinds of products out of this stuff, custom polygon products for, for customers and, and uh, charge them a lot of money for it, you know? Yes? Anything that you can zoom in and turn from county into street map? The question is can you turn county, into, county map into a street map with Tiger? You can because they have street level data down to a very fine level. The problem with Tiger is that every county is responsible for maintaining their own data. So you have, let's say, for instance, I'm from a county called DeSoto in Mississippi. Not from, that's where I'm currently living. I'm actually not from there, disclaimer. But uh, the county I live in is DeSoto County, Mississippi. It happens to be a rich county. It's the richest county in Mississippi. They have a GAIS department to beat the band. Their data is better than Teleatlas. Now you have another county next door, Marshall County, the poorest county in the state. They don't even have a GIS department. I went down there the other day to get a deed from a property I owned in Marshall County. There's a guy working with a paper map that's like 20 years old. It's all wrinkled on the edge and they have an AS400 computer. An AS400 computer to do GIS stuff. It's like, that's just not right, you know? So their data stinks because they don't keep it up to date. Now I'm sure when you look at, you know, Alameda or Santa, Cl Santa Clara, is it the big one here? Their data is probably great. Uh, they're probably within 30 to 100 feet on everything. They have address level data. You can create your own geocoders. I have a reverse geocoder that I created out of the Tiger data where you can click anywhere on a map and it'll tell you the address of that point. You know, in reverse in terms of the, the standard geocoder, you give it an address and you get a point. Reverse geocoder flips it around. I created that from Tiger data. These, these things are all available for free. The problem is it's county level as to what the quality is. And if it's a, an older city, usually it's fairly good. New York City, excellent data. Um, Los Angeles, pretty good. San Francisco, wonderful. I mean, they, you know, this is the heart of all that stuff. So their, their stuff is wonderful. But as you start to get out into the rural areas, you know, sometimes they miss stuff by a long ways. There's a county, uh, or there's a, a, an interstate in Arkansas that's off by 100 miles. You know, it's like, didn't anybody notice they put it on the wrong place on the map? You know, it's like, well, you know, eh, it does go through. You know, it just <laughs> through the wrong place. So that's the problem with that data. However, on the other side of the coin is because it's free and it's so vast and it covers so much, so much area, you can leverage it to a lot of purposes. And if you have some sort of self-correcting mechanism, you know, you can actually correct the data yourself uh, by... Move on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so static data tiles in conclusion. Uh, they work for any area. Um, sorry to cut you off there. Uh, they work for any area. Uh, they're uh, great for large, large um, geographic areas. They work for any zoom. Um, they're not good for time sensitive data. And another thing they can't do is you can't, for instance, pass something that a, a, on the client, on the browser, you can't pass a selection data, a piece of data to get a different tile. Now the way you can monkey that up by creating a lot of different tile layers, but that's your only different your only way to do a static data tile. Okay, dynamic data tiles. Dynamic data tiles are created on the fly. They're created when you they're demanded, and that's a it's a pretty cool thing. Um, you can use it for your own clustering algorithms on the server instead of doing it in JavaScript. You can do it with time sensitive data, like for instance weather or sales data as it comes in. You know, let's say for instance you're showing houses that are sold. If a house is sold and you're depicting them on a map, it'll show immediately because you're, you're creating the data, right, or the tile right out of the data. It is dependent on a lot of programming skill. Um, that's probably one of the real drawbacks to this. And the other thing that's kind of a, a limiter on this is server uh, resources because it sucks the, the, 
the life out of your server. You have to be uh, you know, pretty robust. You have to have a good quality server in order to be able to create tiles on the fly. I use a, a my current server is a quad, a three gigahertz uh, quad with, uh, I think I have six gig of RAM in the thing and I'm running a mirrored 10,000 RPM hard drives and it's pretty fast. But you know, when it gets loaded down, it can be slow. So you have to be, you have to weigh the advantages versus the disadvantages. Now one of the things that you can do is you can mix and match. And uh, here's an example. Let me go to this. Uh, you, can, you can mix and match these things. So let's say, for instance, on this map here, um, this is the same county. This is a, a static tile layer, layer created from data as the background layer. And then as I zoom in, I only have this on zoom level 9 for this uh, demonstration. So as I hit zoom level 9, now we have these little points pop up on the map. And these points are actually, what I'm doing here is I'm creating these tiles in the background with these points. And they're these cities that are, um, that are contained on these points. And what's cool about this is as you mouse over it, it turns into a hand, just like a marker. But it's not a marker. It's a point on a static tile. And when you click it, you get an info window. And the thing moved down, and it populated some more. And we got some more cities in, in this uh, thing. What I'm doing here, actually, is each tile carries along with it the metadata that supports the tile as a cookie. So this is really a, a, it's, it's a kind of a simple concept, but it's fairly revolutionary, I suppose. I, <laughs> I found it so. But what the idea is, is as you create the tile, you have the data, just like with the county map that, I, that you changed the boundaries. As you create that tile, you have the data that supports it. So you pass it simply as a cookie. You just attach it as a cookie to the image, and the image can transport cookies, as everybody knows, just as well as any other thing, a page or, or anything else. So you can then harvest that cookie and maintain that data as an array. In this case, what I do is I, I maintain it as an array of object, objects by tile name. So when I'm over a tile, I know by mousing over what that tile name is. And when I hit that point, I know that there's only so many points in that tile. So instead of having to go iterate over this entire array, which could be thousands of points, to locate that specific point, I'm only looking at the points on that, that are contained on that tile, because it's the object only has the points that are in that aisle, uh, tile. So there may be a dozen instead of thousands. So it's very snappy, you know? I mean, it, that's fast. But this is simulating marker behavior. And these points are pitiful looking, but you know, I, I didn't spend a lot of time on graphics. I'm not a graphics person. I'm, I'm a programmer. I, you know, I, my, my wife says I have no color taste, and I, I like purple and, and green, you know? <laughs> Looks good to me, but you know, she doesn't like it. So the search is done in JavaScript. The, yeah, the point, the point operation here, what I'm doing is in, in, in a JavaScript array, and, and Marcelo Montagno, an associate of mine, he, he wrote that. It's in this, in this page. Um, what's actually happening is, is as the mouse moves, every time the mouse moves, this little JavaScript chunk goes and iterates through an array and says, OK, do I have any points within 10 pixels of this point? And if it's within 10 pixels, I switch from an invisible marker that's located somewhere on that map I set the point of that marker to that point. And by setting the marker to that point, it turns into a hand. So it's, it's kind of clever. Um, it works really well, though, as you can see. I mean, you, it, it works just the same as the standard map with markers. But there are no markers. So there's no limit. You know, you're not limited by markers. And you can do your clustering on the server. So you can pick your clustering options on the server instead of in the client. So you may have some secret clustering system that you don't want to divulge. Well, on the server, you, you can do all kinds of secret stuff. You can keep that stuff to yourself. You don't have to publish it. When it's in JavaScript, you can't see, keep it secret. If somebody wants to see it and they want to copy it, it's there for everyone to see. So the difference between doing it on the server and doing it on the browser is many fold. And security is a big one. Like, for instance, these points. If somebody wanted to harvest these points, they could get them pixel locations only. They couldn't get latitudes and longitudes. So they would have to translate those latitudes and longitudes 
back into, or I mean those pixels, back into latitudes and longitudes in order to har harvest your points. And they wouldn't be as precise as your original data. So you can hide this data from your users and instead of just being an XML file that you can just Firefox, you know, look under Firebug, look under the, the different things that are loaded in that script, click on it, and bam, there it is. All the data that's loaded by that program, copy, paste. Now they've got it on their server. You know, so instead, this is a lot trickier because this data comes across as cookies, and it's actually, they would have a, a real trick of a time getting this data out of this uh, program and into, into their own. Uh, it's certainly not anything like stealing an XML file. It would require real programming. So that's another advantage of using these dynamic data tiles. And of course, this data can change as, as you do it. Uh, but there's virtually no limit to what you can do with something like this. I, I find this really cool, you know, myself. Any questions? Could you have map objects behind that too? Like, could you show the streets and all the other regular... Oh, sure. Stuff? Absolutely. This is just a, a transparent tile layer. So you could put anything you want on here, you and you have can two transparent tile layers. You could have five. No, but there, is there actually two being drawn there, like yeah. one on top of another, yep. or do you draw it all on the server and send just one in? No, this is this is actually two two layers. This is a static data layer that you that you saw in the previous demonstration, overlaid with a dynamic data layer. So these are two layers. These are if we look at. Uh, that know. works in all browsers and everything. Yeah, it. It's standard Google map stuff. This is nothing revolutionary or different. This is the same exact stuff that when you look at a satellite image with a hybrid overlay. You have a one layer that's that's on the bottom, overlaid by another one that's on top. You can choose the order in which these things appear too. You could put you could flip it the other way and make the satellite images uh, transparent and show the you know hybrid under, but it wouldn't be as pretty. Right. You know? So you can choose which is on top and which is on bottom. You can have multiple layers. You can, you know, this is two, but I've never tried it with more, but I'm imagining you can put as many as you want. You can three, four, five. <laughs> you know, but every time, every layer is going to require another tile fetch. So there is, you know, some limits in terms of performance. Once you start, you know, if you had to fetch five tiles to, to fill out one layer, you know, one square, that would be kind of a, you know, drag on, on everything, including your server. But, you know, the idea is that you... Make your static stuff static. You make your dynamic stuff cheap and easy so that you lower the, the server load. And what I actually did in this thing here is I calculated all the positions in advance, put them in a field in the database along with the tile number. So when I send in a tile number to, to fetch, the program does a simple Postgres SQL query, said, give me the data for this tile number. And bam, it pops in. I don't do anything spatial here. This is all done as uh, standard integer keys, which integer keys work great, as everybody knows. And then, of course, you have your standard, you know, click on the sidebar thing and wherever that is, and here it is right up here. That's Gridley, California. So, go ahead. So you're using GD in order to then generate the tiles for the dynamic, dynamic data? Yes, the question is, how is it generated? It's generated with GD and Perl and Postgres doing a standard regular SQL query and plotting these points. I just draw, a, it's actually, a, I think it's a line object in, um, in a, a GD that's like 10 pixels long, but the, the width, the, the thickness is 10. I think it's 10 or 8, I'm not sure. And then I do a smaller yellow dot inside of it. So you know, that's how I make it's yellow and purple. So it's not 256 times 256? Oh, the tiles are yes. I'm talking about these little teeny points, oh, okay. but it's 99% empty space. Yes. So, you know, it, it, of that 256 by 256 image, I've just got little tiny little itsy bitsy points here. And I have, I have the, the program that generates these, the database here. I actually downloaded this data from um, geonames.org. This is us.zip. And then I pulled out all the cities that had greater than 3,000 people. Yes? What if the point's right on the edge of the tile? The question is, what do you do when it's on the edge of a tile? Now, cleverly, <laughs> what I did is I checked. I checked to see if the image fell within a half the distance of the width of the image. I just moved it over a little. <laughs> so cheated, you know. And, and actually, that's, that's a way to obfuscate your data as well. You can obfuscate your data if you want to keep the exact 
data from falling into the wrong hands, you can maneuver the points around a little bit, you know, mess with it. So that uh, <laughs> if somebody does copy, copy your data, maybe the numbers spell out the name of your company, you know, in binary. And then you say, hey, this is our data. See, it spells us, it says so right here. So, you know, there's, there's all kinds of fun things you can do in there. And, and uh, I see a lot of questions on the forum about security of data. You know, when you're using JavaScript and XML, goose egg. You have no security. Uh, you can try, but you have none. Using server-side techniques, you have lots of security. You can do whatever you want. So that's, that's the, the cleverness of this. Any other questions? Okie doke. So let's see. And I think that pretty much wraps it up. So in conclusion, uh, dynamic data tiles on the fly offer all kinds of flexibility. Um, doesn't say so here, but it's, you have the security of being able to uh, keep your data close to your chest. You don't have to pass it as a, uh, as a cookie like I did. You can just put the name of that piece of data on the tile and not pass it. Keep it, keep it private. There's a lot of things you can do with it. But it does come at a, a pretty stiff price. The, the power required to generate these tiles is pretty immense. But it's still, on this little teeny laptop, you see how fast it was. So it's not insurmountable. If you have a really busy website where you're getting uh, 10 or 20,000 visitors a day, you're going to probably have to do some load balancing systems, you know, use multiple servers and, and uh, um, you know, share the load. But that's also pretty easy to do. So, okay. Any questions? Any other questions? All right. Getting help. Now, if you need help on any of these things, there's the Google Maps API discussion group. Now, we, we always recommend that you use that resource as heavily as you can because there are experts all around the world who are helping you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In England, they don't celebrate Thanksgiving. And in, you know, um, Various countries, they don't celebrate Christmas and New Year's in China is a different time than, than it is here, you know. So at 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can get your question answered usually in a matter of minutes. And that's really amazing. You ask a question, as long as it's intelligently phrased, it's not like uh, something like, help. Yeah. You know, help is not the way you <laughs> ask the question. <laughs> right, we get that a lot. Help. D desperate for help, you know, it's like, okay, this isn't a singles <laughs> bar, you know, this, this is a, a help form. So, you know, you state your, the standard rules of asking a question hold true. State a, a, your, the, the question in a short bit. Always include a link to your existing page. If you don't have a link to your existing page, upload it to Google Pages before you ask the question because we got to see the page. If you ask a question about JavaScript, cannot answer it by just saying, my page is jerky and it doesn't perform the way I want. How do I fix it? That's obviously not a good way to answer the question, ask the question. But if you put in a link to your page, even if you don't have the clearest question, we can go and look at it. We can run it through the debugger. We can uh, do all kinds of stuff. We can see you know, where the errors lie and say, hey, well, you know, on line 23, you, here, you missed the variable name. Uh, yes? I, I just forgot. I have so many things going around in my head. I just okay. Then there's also the map key. The map key is uh, E&D's uh, website where he's uh, uh, created a wiki kind of system. Um, I like it. It's, it's not really totally well organized yet, but it's got such a wealth of information. You know, like for instance, that tile cutter and a lot of that stuff is all there. There's all kinds of examples and knowledge. It's a huge, huge tool that, that I recommend everybody use. And then of course, Google is your friend. You know, if you can't get your answer from in the time span that you need it from the first two resources, go to Google and just type it in. Odds are somebody's already asked and answered that question. So. Yeah, shouldn't that be your first resource? <laughs> no, actually not. I, I think that the first resources go to the Google Maps discussion board and search within that, mm -hmm. yeah. because um, then you're you're not you're not getting you know noise. weird you know breast en enlargement things and. <laughs> And <laughs> strange stuff that, <laughs> well, it, it seems like no matter what you search for, you always get some weird thing, you know. Where's uh, those Google, the Google guys to fix that problem? It's, it's a feature, right? It's a feature. 
Okay, so software and data use in the discussion, I used a Perl 5.88 with DBI, that's the, the module. GD and CGI, those are the, the modules that you need to run this under Perl. Um, I have two uh, Perl modules that I wrote, uh, US Navigide underscore Google underscore RelPix. That's to calculate a relative pixel location on a map. You just pass it a latitude and a longitude and a zoom, and it'll bring you back um, uh, the, the pixel. That, where you have to put it on the particular image, whatever you're working with. Uh, the tiles module calculates the values of each tile. Um, Postgres 8.2 is what I use with PostGIS. Uh, anything over po Postgres 7.4, I think 7.3 works well with spatial uh, things. Uh, GIS, I think PostGIS 7.4 you have to be on above. Uh, one thing if you're going to use PostGIS on a Linux box, you have to build it from source. It's really easy. You just download the module from um, the Postgres website and go to the quick make uh, uh, instructions. It's like five steps to build uh, Postgres from source. But you need to build it from source in order to add the PostGIS module. If you're a Windows user, PostGIS comes included with the binary uh, for uh, Postgres. And let's see, uh, Apache 2.0 web server, um, but you could still use, I guess, IIS, although I don't know why you'd want to. Uh, projected image dot JS JavaScript. Um, yeah, US Census, cartography, boundary county uh, shape file, that was the, the shape files. Geonames.org, US zip files. And all the data for this example can be downloaded from this URL, um, including this presentation. This presentation is a PDF. So if you want to download that as well or, or review it or see anything that you missed. So does, does the zip file include this, thing, this information as well? Uh, yeah. Um, like a readme or something? Yeah, I don't know how much readme is there. But uh, once you explode it out, it, I would say take a look at it. There's a lot of comments in the programs. Um, it's kind of, I guess the readme is this PDF, you know, that gives the demonstration and, and the names of everything. But all the data, yes, go ahead. After the dot com, you said WS dot and then? Uh, dash, that's a WS 2008-02 for this month. I'll, um, I'll send out the URL for all of this stuff, so you don't have to be writing down the URL right now. And if you want to put that on some other, um, on a Google site, if that'd be fine too. Yeah. You said you had a download site for it that you wanted. I just put it here for, because that's my server. I have control over that one. Um, and special thanks to Marcelo Montagna for, for helping me with some of those examples. Any other questions? Okay, that's it.